Welcome back to Gaming on the Fringe. One of the reasons that science fiction appeals to me so much is it lets us examine ways that new technology can change our world and what new doors that could open up. Before I start this episode, let's quickly discuss the difference between hard and soft science fiction. Hard sci-fi is when the material takes its science very seriously. Sure, there may be two or three things here that are beyond current science, but it's at least plausible science. Medium science fiction may not feature all scientifically possible technology, but it at least establishes self-consistent rules for its fantastic tech. Finally, soft sci-fi just uses the trope of sci-fi and doesn't worry about actual science. Hmm. You want examples, don't you? <sighs> Fine. Hard sci-fi is stuff like The Expanse or Firefly. Medium sci-fi is stuff like Star Trek or Back to the Future. Soft sci-fi is direct like Star Wars, which is just a standard fantasy trope decked out like sci-fi. Yeah. I went there. I mention that because in harder sci-fi is sometimes what TV trips calls one big lie. This is where a sci-fi setting takes one bit of tech that may be just a bit beyond current physics, but otherwise follows real world science. The game example that is the best example of this is the fantastic Mass Effect. Now I could gush about the trilogy which is easily in my top 10 games of all time, but here I'm focused on the technology. The titular Mass Effect explains just about every single standard sci-fi trope in the series which is a fantastic example of allowing one piece of tech so it can explore how it affects other technology. Essentially, Mass Effect is based upon the idea of negative mass, but they take that one idea and build an entire civilization's tech upon it. Now, I touched upon negative mass in the previous video, so I won't go too much into it, but with Mass Effect, you can add or remove mass from a given section of space-time. It all depends on how much charge and whether it's a positive or negative charge. Use the Mass Effect of Element Zero are usually called Ezo, gives you this ability. Now, of course, element zero wouldn't actually exist since the atomic number is the number of particles in nucleus, and zero means there is none, but it's just a nickname they come up with in the universe. Now, you may have an idea of what decreasing mass would help with, but what about increasing mass? By applying a simple positive charge to a chunk of element zero, you can make it a supermassive object. Much like your mother, an object of extremely high mass would have a strong gravitational field, thereby giving you artificial gravity. This lets your awesome starships have gravity applied spinning sections or acceleration, which is pretty handy. Besides that use, by applying strong gravitational fields to materials, you can compress them into very strong building materials, as well as creating a bottle containing fusion for power generation. This bottle contains the very plasma that causes fusion reactions to happen. Plasma is a superheated state of matter where atoms are flying around at incredibly high speeds, but it gets very hot. For example, the sun. The bottle compresses the fusion reaction so we can actually control it to harness energy. Currently, we can only do this by either means of very, very strong magnetic fields or inertia. Having gravity do this would make things simple. Now, decreasing mass is far more interesting. First, it makes sending anything into orbit easier by decreasing its mass so that there's much less energy needed to escape gravity. After all, sending one gram into orbit is a lot cheaper and easier than sending one kilogram. This makes surface-to-orbit shipping a trivial matter, not to mention making it easier for ships to accelerate in space since there's less mass for the thrusters to push. But let's be honest here. You're not as interested in that. You want to know how mass effect faster than light operates. Problem with breaking the light speed barrier is that as a massed object accelerates closer to the speed of light, it gains mass from the energy required to speed up. Since this was predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity, it's called relativistic mass. Now the problem is to achieve light speed, not break it, you would need infinite mass, and such require infinite energy. Yeah, that ain't happening. The way Mass Effect gets around this is by making an area of negative mass so the problem is averted, essentially raising the speed of light in that location. What's interesting is that compared to other FTL mechanisms, that this one has no motive power of its own, so the ships have to use their normal thrusters, which range from fusion torches to ion drives up to antimatter-powered engines to move the ship. In a very smart nod to physics, the second half of any journey is actually done by flipping the ship over end to end, firing in reverse to decelerate the rest of the journey. Now, for normal ships, this allows a full day's travel to be about 12 light years. Although the Reapers can pull off over 30 light years in a day, even though the Council races have no idea how in the hell that works. Well, this is great for getting around to nearby stars. The problem is the Mass Effect operates on a galactic scale so there needs to be faster options. For this, you need the Mass Effect Relay. These gargantuan devices use massive, no pun intended, Mass Effect cores to remake 
hundreds of light years massless so the ships can instantaneously jump from relay to relay. Now for longer trips you may have to use multiple relays but the effect is still incredibly fast travel. The small problem exists that the relays were developed by the long extinct Protheans and no one knows how to construct even a small relay. Now what's very cool is that in the most recent game Mass Effect Andromeda, alien races of the Andromeda galaxy figured out a way to have fast travel without relays. The kit used their Mass Effect cores to create an all cubieri warp drive effect to avert the need for relays. What's that you ask? Don't worry, that's another episode. Now, Mass Effect would certainly be useful in real life, but we don't know of anything that can produce negative mass or positive mass that we can't see. Or do we? Let's enter the crazy world of dark matter and dark energy. We don't call it dark matter like we do dark humor or dark color, but more like the dark web. It does not directly interact with light. What's that? What's dark humor? It's this kind of joke that's like this. What happens when an AIDS patient, a priest, and a pedophile enter the bar? And then they ate all the mustard. <laughs> That's great. I know you're loving that one. Alright. Anyway. Let's talk dark matter and dark energy. What are they? We don't have a fucking clue. Despite Einstein's famous equation proving matter and energy are the same, these two are not co-equivalent. If you take all the stuff in this universe, then just the matter that we're used to, which is called baryonic matter, since it's made of particles called baryons, makes up less than 5% of the entire mass energy of the universe. We discovered dark matter by calculating the estimated masses of galaxies and realizing that the visible matter alone could not have the mass necessary to generate the gravity that holds them together. As for dark energy, we discovered that when we found out galaxies were traveling away from us and speeding up, just how dark energy was hypothesized. Let's take these one by one. Dark matter is interesting because the only way we have seen it is by a technique known as gravitational lensing. Dark matter does not absorb or reflect light so you can't see it, however it does have gravity and that gravity can bend light that passes by it. We think that this makes up about 27% of the mass energy of the universe, and we have actually mapped out sections of the universe with dark matter by the use of gravitational lensing and it shows that dark matter actually creates the largest structure in the universe. It's known as the dark matter web and it's a branching network of dark matter that holds together galaxies and galactic clusters. Oddly, not only does dark matter not interact with light, we don't think it even interacts with ordinary matter. If you held a chunk of dark matter in your hand, it would just evaporate through your hand since it passes through ordinary matter. Now this may sound like nonsense, but there are particles that do the exact same and they're called neutrinos, which is Italian for little neutral one. For example, neutrinos interact with ordinary matter so rarely that for most people, they see their 10th birthday before the first time a neutrino interacts with one of their atoms. The one thing we know about dark matter currently is that it's non-luminous and has mass. Current theory holds that dark matter is a relic of the Big Bang, and while the rest of ordinary matter was condensing down from energy, dark matter strung across the expanding baby universe. There are various ideas of what dark matter may be, including the obvious that it doesn't exist and we're looking at something wrong. But I'm going to look at two of the most popular ideas which appropriately enough sound like they should be opposite of each other. WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, are particles that do not interact with other matter besides gravity and possibly the weak nuclear force. This force is the force that causes subatomic decay and nuclear fission. Now these WIMPs are far more massive than similar sized subatomic particles which would explain dark matter's high mass in the universe. Now the other theory is machos, or massive compact halo objects. These are actually made of baryonic matter, like matter we are used to day to day, but are objects of extremely strong gravity. These range from black holes to neutron stars to brown dwarfs. Now, black holes are the corpses of supermassive stars whose gravity is so strong that when they die, collapses to produce areas of gravity that not even light can escape. For reference, as I said last video, the speed of light is 186 miles per second, which means the gravity in a black hole is so strong you need to go faster than that to get out. This is why black holes are black. No light that passes the edge, which is called the event horizon, will ever come back. Now neutron stars are made similar, but it come from smaller stars. The atoms collapse so strongly that, the teaspoon, that a teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh over 10 million tons. It may be only the size of a large city, yet would have more mass than our own sun. Now, meanwhile, a brown dwarf is a failed star that never achieved nuclear fusion and ignited. It's actually sometimes theorized that Jupiter is a brown dwarf because of its size and its hydrogen composition. Now, brown dwarfs do have heavy gravity for their size, but they do not emit light like a star was because they never ignited. Now, science is still looking for more proof of dark matter as well as to find out what it is. 
But now what about dark energy? The mass energy of dark energy is over 70% of the full mass energy of the universe. That's impressive enough, but remember the converting the ordinary and dark matter of the universe to energy. Relativity states that the energy of mass is that mass times the speed of light squared. That's 186,000 miles per second times 186,000 miles per second times the mass. Now, I went and asked people with actual math and science degrees if I, that would be a lot and was told, yes, that is quite a lot. And well, of course it's a lot. Are you sure you graduated high school? Dark energy is a repulsive energy that is accelerating the expansion of the universe and may well cause the end of our universe. If the universe keeps expanding, eventually galaxies and stars will become too far apart to keep warm which is called the heat death of the universe. This could in fact be negative mass and energy as we discussed earlier in this video and preceding one. Now much like dark matter, we have seen dark energy through gravitational lensing, but also through another relativistic effect called redshift. As light takes longer to get to us, it shifts in frequency towards the red end of the scale. Now you're familiar with the spectrum of the rainbow. There's red on one end and violet on the other. These are not just colors, they're frequencies of light and it's based on how fast the wavelength moves in that light. As light takes longer to get to us, it shifts in frequency towards the red end of the scale. We can measure this shift to get the approximate distance, but dark energy seems to be accelerating this red shift. This energy also seems to permeate the universe like the cosmic background radiation, which is a relic of the Big Bang itself. This seems to indicate dark energy was a product of the Big Bang. So what could it be? Theories range from it being the cosmological constant, which means it's an intrinsic part of our universe, to an idea called quintessence. This is a field that permeates the universe and varies in strength area to area. Now the cosmological constant was actually discovered by Einstein who used it as a way to bounce his equations because he wanted a universe that was static and never changing. He later called it his biggest mistake, but if he had kept it then he would have shown expansion decades before it was discovered. It is thought to be vacuum energy, which is predicted by quantum theory. In quantum mechanics, empty space is not empty, but is full of virtual particles and antiparticles that appear and annihilate each other creating loads of energy. This doesn't violate the conservation of mass because these particles and antiparticles cancel each other out as soon as they come back in. But this vacuum energy would be the easiest way to explain dark energy. This, unfortunately, the same quantum theory posits a cosmological constant over 100 times larger than what's observed, while supersymmetry theory posits a zero constant. One can only hope as science marches on. Quintessence is unique. It's a scalar field which is a field of energy that assigns a value to every point in an area so, such as like pressure in a fluid. It was actually proposed to be a new fundamental force of physics and is variable unlike the cosmological constant. Interestingly, this field could be both repulsive or attractive depending on whether it has more kinetic or potential energy. In fact, once an area of quintessence states that it is actually the reason why our universe hasn't had any more big bangs, let alone big rips which would compress it back to the beginning or other such time singularities. I don't know that the developers of Mass Effect had this theory in mind or even heard about it, but it's interesting that Mass Effect mirrors it that well. While scientists keep trying to find more evidence of exactly what dark matter and energy are, they can still be great tools for interesting science fiction. The original ending for Mass Effect was that dark energy was increasing due to Mass Effect usage of civilizations, so why the Reaper showed up to harvest it every so often. And this is reflected in Mass Effect 2 as Tyler is studying why one of the stars that they have been researching was dying so quickly when it sh shouldn't have died that early. I find it very interesting that Mass Effect actually mirrors quintessence very well. The best science fiction always tries to at least maintain internal consistency, which Mass Effect does perfectly. I'd honestly call it the best science fiction game series to date. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below or contact me on Twitter. And thank you for watching.